This is Saurabh and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The Weekly Show with Aditya. Are sports athletes role models? Do their actions on the field specially influence individuals who want to take up that particular sport? It is a difficult question to answer, but let's decode and see if sports athletes are supposed to be role models. Because if you ask them, they do not bother about their actions on the field influencing impressionable minds who want to do the same theatrics when they start taking up that particular sport. Sports is both a theatre and a profession at the same time. Sports athletes have shelf life. So it is the sport itself which influences an individual, not the sports athlete because they are like revolving doors. They come and go. So in a sports field, for example, let's take football. When a goal is scored and the footballer, they slide onto the ground, they take off their shirt and they spit out all kinds of words are we supposed to see that as these athletes not being good role models well if you ask them they are not concerned about being good or bad role model just like any other profession athletes take up sports because they are good in it because they see it as a source of their livelihood that's what sports is for them a performance a profession and a source of livelihood. They know that they have at best 12 to 13 years of their career. So why not invest in it? In the context of ethics and morals, let's take a recurring example which had become a rage on pseudo media with context to mankading in the sport of cricket. Cricket, as we all know, is a bizarre sport with ambiguous rules. It's a sport brought by the imperial side to the colonies and we all know what happened later. Let's take the example of mancading. As we all know in cricket, at one time there are 13 players on the field, 11 from the bowling team and two from the batting team. The two batters are called striker and non-striker. Striker is the one who faces the baller ready to hit fours, sixes or eventually get out. Non-striker is the one who is on the same side as the baller ready to run and take strike. And this is where the issue of man cadding came in. And for the past seven decades, it has been discussed that whether this idea or this dismissal of man cadding is ethical, moral or in the spirit of the game. For me, words like ethics, moral, spirit of the game should not be part of a sport. Sports is meant to be aggressive. Sports athletes are not supposed to bother about whether they are doing something wrong or right because their actions do not influence anyone directly or indirectly. And if a sports athlete does something on the field which is perceived as wrong or not moral or unethical or not in the spirit of the sport and if young impressionable children who want to take up that sport emulate it then it's up to the young impressionable children to be mature enough to understand that you're not supposed to follow these individuals blindly and without thinking the most irritating part for me is when we look at a sport athlete's background whether they came from an affluent background or a not so affluent background and for multitude of reasons, they took up this sport so that they could live a luxurious life. Now the question becomes, if a sports athlete comes from a not so affluent background, but eventually after spending 10 to 15 years in that sport and earning a good amount of revenue, should 
We scoff at these same individuals just because they build luxurious houses for themselves or they have so many cards. Well, if they can afford it, then they deserve it. It's a simple matter. There is no debate about it. And it's completely irrelevant whether a sports athlete came from a small city, a big city, a rural area, an urban area because once they were part of the national team or any other team and once they showed their potential, they deserve to earn that amount they are given and they also deserve to have a luxurious life. The debate has also been that when sports athletes take up the sport or future athletes decide to take up a certain sport, it means that they may be giving on up on the academic life, which means that if they're not able to do well in that sport, they don't have a plan B to bank upon. Let's come back to this man getting story, which has been talked about on all media, print, electronic and pseudo for the past one week. In fact, it has been going on for the past year ever since Ashwin, a member of the Punjab team and now drafted into the Delhi team, has been in the line of fire because he ran out of batter. And when he was drafted into the Delhi team, the man getting controversy followed him like a bad rash. So how did he exactly attempt this? Understand that this particular tournament is a domestic tournament. It has no impact on international relations between countries. So as I said, there is a striker and a non-striker in cricket. If the non-striker attempts to run even before the bowler has completed that action, the bowler has the right, the legal right to run him out. Whether it's wrong or right is a matter of debate and it's difficult to assess because there will always be a sign which will say the batter had taken a few steps in advance to run and get the single. The bowler has every right to tell him do not have any kind of advantage because I am also a part of the game. You are not the only one dominating the game. So when last year, in last year's T20 domestic competition, he ran out the non-striker who was Josh Butler. He appealed to the umpire who decided to refer to the third umpire who eventually gave the batter out. So the debate ends there. Either we give the two standing umpires and a third umpire the power to overturn or ignore such appeals but ironically in cricket the umpires are the most hapless of all umpires in any sport in any other sport the umpire would have taken a decision the ground referee would have taken a decision or referred it upstairs but there would have been a decision here it took hours means minutes for the umpires to come to a conclusion but this year, instead of running out the batter, he gave a warning. And to make it even more ridiculous, he sent out a message on the pseudo media that I'm giving a warning to everyone. Don't target me if I run out somebody else in the future. Whether Ashwin runs out a batter in the future because he is backing up too far or is running even before the bowler has completed his or her action. Do not get into the space of whether it's ethical, moral or in the spirit. As I said, sports matches, sports athletes are not supposed to bother about abstract things like morality, ethics or spirit. They are supposed to perform. If they have to be ruthless, they should be ruthless. They are here to earn a living and not live up to the standards of what is expected from them from pseudo-experts and their fanatics and psychophants. If such action triggered up a debate on pseudo-media between the fanatics of the athlete and the critics of the athlete, the athlete should not even bother about it. 
because such an argument between the psychophants and the fans versus the critics have no standing they are not credible they don't influence how the sport is played because the fans are pseudo the platform is pseudo and the cricketer is more interested in earning a living than bothering about whether what i am doing is right or wrong individuals who go on to become sports athletes who represent their domestic or international teams on that international level they know what they are getting into they know that there is no time for being nice to the other person they are supposed to represent their team where the team representation is only 1% of it 99% is for personal glory and to earn a livelihood and not bother about abstract things like ethics morals any other pseudo debate which crops up labors of hercules forward and chapter 1 yet there was between this hercule poirot and hercules of classical lore one point of resemblance both of them undoubtedly had been instrumental in providing the world of certain pests each of them could be described as a benefactor to the society he lived in what had dr burton said last night as he left yours are not the labors of hercules ah but there he was wrong the old fossil there should be once again the labors of hercules a modern hercules an ingenious and amusing conceit in the period before his final retirement he would accept 12 cases no more no less and those 12 cases should be selected with special reference to the 12 labors of ancient hercules yes that would not only be amusing it would be artistic it would be spiritual poirot picked up the classical dictionary and immersed himself once more in classical lore he did not intend to follow his prototype too closely there should be no women no sort of nesses the labors and the labors only the first labor then would that be of the nemean lion the nemean lion he repeated trying it over on his tongue naturally he did not expect a case to present itself actually involving a flesh and blood lion it would be too much of a coincidence should he be approached by the directors of the zoological gardens to solve a problem for them involving a real lion no here symbolism must be involved the first case must concern some celebrated public figure it must be sensational and of the first importance some master criminal or alternately someone who was a lion in the public eye some well known writer or politician or painter or even royalty he liked the idea of royalty he would not be in a hurry he would wait wait for the case of high importance that should be the first of his self imposed labors chapter 1 the nemean lion anything of interest this morning miss lemon he asked as he entered the room the following morning he trusted miss lemon she was a woman without imagination but she had an instinct anything that she mentioned as word consideration usually was word consideration she was a born secretary nothing much monsieur poirot 
there is just one letter that I thought might interest you. I have put it on the top of the pile. And what is that? He took an interested step forward. It's from a man who wants you to investigate the disappearance of his wife's Pekingese dog. Poirot paused with his foot still in the air. He threw a glance of deep reproach at Miss Lemon. She did not notice it. She had begun to type. She typed with the speed and precision of a quick firing tank. Poirot was shaken. Shaken and embittered, Miss Lemon, the efficient Miss Lemon, had let him down. A Pekingese dog, a Pekingese dog, and after the dream he had last night, he had been leaving Buckingham Palace after being personally thanked when his valet had come in with his morning chocolate. Words trembled on his lips, witty, caustic words. He did not utter them because Miss Lemon, owing to the speed and efficiency of her, her typing, would not have heard them. With a grunt of disgust, he picked up the topmost letter from the little pile on the side of his desk. Yes, it was exactly as Miss Lemon had said. A city address, a curt business-like unrefined demand. The subject the kidnapping of a Pekingese dog, one of those bulging-eyed, over-pampered pets of a rich woman. Hercule Pirot's lips curled as he read it. Nothing unusual about this, nothing out of the way. But yes, yes, in one small detail, Miss Lemon was right. In one small detail, there was something unusual. Hercule Poirot sat down. He read the letter slowly and carefully. It was not the kind of case he wanted. It was not the kind of case he had promised himself. It was not in any sense an important case. It was supremely unimportant. It was not. And here was the crux of his objection. It was not a proper labor of Hercules. But unfortunately, he was curious. Yes, he was curious. He raised his voice so as to be heard by Miss Lemon above the noise of her typing. Bring up this Sir Joseph Hoggin, he ordered, and make an appointment for me to see him at his office, as he suggests. As usual, Miss Lemon had been right. Homer's Iliad Book 1 And Hera, the queen, her dark eyes wide, exclaimed, Dread Majesty, son of Cronus, what are you saying? Now, surely I've never probed or pride in the past. Why, you can scheme to your heart's content without a qualm in the world for me. But now I have a terrible fear that she has won you over. Thetis, the old man of the sea's daughter, Thetis, with her glistening feet. I know it. Just as dawn, she knelt beside you and grasped your knees, and I suspect you bowed your head in assent to her. You granted once and for all to exalt Achilles now and slaughter hordes of Achaeans pinned against their ships. And Zeus, who marshals the thunderheads, returned, maddening one, you and your eternal suspicions. I can never escape you. Ah, but tell me, Hera, just what can you do about all this? Nothing? Only estrange yourself from me a little more, and all the worse for you? If what you say is true, that must be my pleasure. Now go sit down, be quiet now, obey my orders, for fear the gods. However many Olympus holds are powerless to protect you when I come to throttle you with my irresistible 
and he subsided but hira the queen her eyes wider was terrified she sat in silence she went her will to his and throughout the halls of zeus the gods of heaven quake with fear hepa sestes the master craftsman rose up first to harangue them all crying now to bring his loving mother a little comfort the white arm goddess hera oh disaster that's what it is and it will be unbearable if the two of you must come to blows this way flinging the gods in chaos just for mortal men no more joy for us in the sumptuous feast when riot rules the day i urge you mother you know that i am right walk back into his good graces so the father our beloved father will never wheel on us again send our banquets crushing the olympian lord of lightning what if he would like to blast us from our seats he is far too strong go back to him mother stroke the father with soft winning words at once the olympus will turn kind to us again pleading springing up with a two handled cup he reached it towards his loving mother's hands with his own winning words patience mother great as you are bear up or dear as you are i have to see you beaten right before my eyes i would be shattered what could i do to save you it's hard to fight the olympian strength for strength you remember the last time i rushed to your defense he seized my foot he hurled me off his tremendous threshold and all day long i dropped i was dead weight and then when the sun went down down i plunge on lemnos little breath left in me but the mortals there soon nursed a fallen immortal back to life at that the white arm goddess hera smiled and smiling took the cup from her child's hands then dipping sweet nectar up from the mixing bowl he poured it round to all the mortals left to right an uncontrollable laughter broke from the happy gods as they watched the god of fire breathing hard and bustling through the halls that are then and all day long till the sun went down they feasted and no gods hunger lacked a share of the handsome banquet or the gorgeous lyre apollo struck or the muses singing voice to voice in choirs their vibrant music rising at last when the sun's fiery light had set each immortal went to rest in his own house the splendid high halls hephaestus built for each with all his craft and cunning the famous crippled smith and olympian zeus the lord of lightning went to his own bed where he had always lain when welcome sleep came on him there he climbed and there he slept and by his side lay hera the queen the goddess of the golden throne tg woodhouse stiff upper lip jeeves thanks he said filling his case i am taking emerald stoker for a walk you are what or a row on the river whichever she prefers but gussy oh before i forget pinker is looking for you he says he wants to see you about something important never mind about stoker you can't take emerald stoker for walks can't i watch me but sorry no time to talk now i don't want to keep her waiting so long i must be off he left me plunged in thought and not agreeable thought either 
I think I have made it clear to the meanest I that my whole future depended on Augustus Fink Nortel sticking to the straight and narrow path and not blotting his copy book. And I could not but feel that by taking Emerald Stoker for walks, he was skidding off the straight and narrow path and blotting his sea in no uncertain manner. That at least was, I was pretty sure how an idealistic Bezel like Madeleine Basset already rendered hot under the collar by his subversive views on sunsets and blessed demoiselles would regard it. It is not too much to say that when Jeeves returned with the whiskey and S, he found me all of a Twitter and shaking on my stem. I would have liked to put him abreast of this latest development, but as I say, there are things we don't discuss. So I mainly drank deep of the flowing bowl and told him that Gussie had just been a pleasant visitor. He tells me Stinker Pinker wants to see me about something. No doubt with reference to the episode of Sir Watkin and the hard boiled egg. Sir, don't tell me it was Stinker who threw it. No, sir, the miscreant is believed to have been a lad in his early teens. But the young fellow's impulsive action has led to unfortunate consequences. It has caused Sir Watkin to entertain doubts as to the wisdom of entrusting a vicarage to curate incapable of maintaining order at a school creed. Miss Bing, while confiding this information to me, appeared greatly distressed. She had supposed, I quote her verbatim, that the thing was in the bag and she is naturally much disturbed. I drained my glass and lit a moody gasper. If Tortellators wanted to turn me into a cynic, it was going the right way about it. There's a curse on this house, Jeeves. Broken blossoms and shattered hopes wherever you look. It seems to be something in the air. The sooner we are out of here, the better. I wonder if we couldn't. I had been about to add make our get away tonight, but at this moment, the door flew open and Spoot came bounding in, wiping the words from my lips and causing me to raise an eyebrow or two. I resented this habit he was developing of popping up out of a trap at me every other minute, like a demon king in pantomime. And only the fact that I couldn't think of anything restrained me from saying something pretty stinging. As it was, I wore the mask and spoke with the suavity of the perfect host. Ah, Spoot, come on in and take a few chairs, I said and was on the point of telling him that we boosters kept open house when he interrupted me with the uncouth abruptness so characteristic of those human gorillas. Roderick Spoot may have had his merits, though I had never been able to spot them, but his warmest admirer couldn't have called him Kut. Have you seen Fink Nautil? He said, I didn't like the way he spoke or the way he was looking. The lips I noted were twitching and the eyes glittered with what I believe is called a baleful light. It seemed pretty plain to me that it was in no friendly spirit that he was seeking Gussie. So I watered down the truth a bit as the prudent man does on these occasions. I'm sorry, no, I've only just got back from my uncle's place over poor sister Shire Way. Some urgent family business came up and I had to go and attend to it so unfortunately missed the school treat. A great disappointment. You haven't seen Gussie, have you? Jeeves made no reply. 
possibly because he wasn't there. He generally slides discreetly off when the young master is entertaining the quality and you never see him go. He just evaporates. Was it something important you wanted to see him about? I want to break his neck. My eyebrows, which had returned to normal, rose again. I also, if I remembered rightly, pursed my lips. Well, really, Spoot, is this not becoming a bit thick? It's not so long ago that you were turning over in your mind the idea of breaking mine. I think you should watch yourself in this manner of neck breaking and check the earth before it gets too strong a grip on you. No doubt you say to yourself that you can take it or leave it alone. But isn't that danger of the thing becoming habit forming? Why do you want to break Gussie's neck? He ground his teeth at least that's what I think he did to them and was silent for a space. Then though there wasn't anyone within earshot but me, he lowered his voice. I can speak frankly to you, Wooster, because you two love her. Her? Who? I said it should have been whom, I suppose, but that didn't occur to me at the time. Madeline, of course. Oh, Madeline. As I told you, I have always loved her and her happiness is very dear to me. It is everything to me. To give her a moment's pleasure, I would cut myself in pieces. I couldn't follow him there, but before I could go into the question of whether girls enjoy Seeing people cut themselves in pieces, he had resumed. It was a great shock to me when she became engaged to this man, Fink Nautil. But I accepted the situation because I thought that that was where her happiness lay. Though stunned, I kept silent. Very wide. I said nothing that would give her a suspicion of how I felt very puka. It was enough for me that she would be happy. Nothing else mattered. But when Fink Nautil turns out to be a libertine, who Gussie, I said, surprised. The last time I would have attached such a label to pure as a driven S. I have thought, if not purer, what makes you think Gussie's a libertine? The fact that less than 10 minutes ago I saw him kissing the cook said Spoot through the teeth which I am pretty sure he was grinding and he dived out of the door and he was gone. For more awesome content, tune in to the next episode of the weekly show Vedaditya.